Welcome back to Special Report. I am joined now by my colleague and host of On the Record, Greta Van Suster. Hello, Greta. Hello, Brett. And we are pleased to welcome to our set former Secretary of State, former New York Senator, and former First Lady Hillary Clinton, author of the current best selling book, Hard Choices. Thank you very much for being here, Madam Secretary. Thank we really you both. appreciate it. Uh, really quickly, a quick word on the format. Mm -hmm. We have 30 minutes with Secretary Clinton. I'll start the questioning for seven minutes, followed by seven minutes uh, from Greta, and we'll take a break at the top of the hour and do it all again. <laughs> so let's begin. Uh, Madam Secretary, obviously the big news today is on Benghazi mm -hmm. and the capture of Abu Qatalib. Mm -hmm. I heard you earlier today um, say by way of context that it took more than 10 years mm -hmm. to pinpoint Osama bin Laden. Right. Isn't there a, a difference in this case in that Abu Qatalib was hiding in plain sight, openly giving interviews to reporters mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. our own Greg Palka? Well, that is absolutely true, Brett, that he uh, was... Uh, uh, in a certain part of, of Libya, uh, and, and he was well protected. And to try to mount an operation such as was carried out successfully on Sunday posed different challenges than the ones that our intelligence uh, forces faced in trying to actually pinpoint bin Laden and then carry out a dangerous uh, operation. But my point is that what we try to do in this country, and I think what was made abundantly clear um, by this latest effort, is we have an unwavering commitment to go after anyone, no matter how long it takes, who is responsible for harming Americans. And everybody around the world who thinks about that, plans that, needs to know that will be the outcome. Should Katala be read his Miranda rights and, and be tried in U.S. civilian court? I don't know all the details uh, about what the plans are, but I believe... But if you were president? Well, if, if I were president and the FBI and the Justice Department and our law enforcement came and said, we're finally ready, uh, Mr. or Madam President, to uh, go and capture and detain uh, this terrorist, and we have enough evidence uh, to successfully prosecute him in our courts, which have proven very successful at prosecuting terrorists, I would say then I'm ready to give the order. I have some more specific Benghazi questions. You may okay. have imagined that. You write in your book that as the attack is happening, you're on the seventh floor of the mm -hmm. State Department, mm -hmm. and then you go to your Washington home, mm -hmm. still in direct communication. Mm -hmm. um, your Deputy Assistant Secretary, Charlene Lamb, testified before Congress that on the night uh, she was in the Diplomatic Security Command Center in Washington, was in real-time contact uh, with the Diplomatic Security Agency uh, agent, rather, who was manning the Tactical Operations Center on the grounds in Benghazi. Uh, he had alerted the embassy in Tripoli, the CIA, the Bureau of Diplomatic Security in Washington. Did you talk to Charlene Lamb that evening? No, I did not, but I was in direct communication with everyone who was. She was not the only one who was monitoring uh, the phone lines because contrary to some of the reports, we did not have real-time video that enabled us to follow what was going on on the ground. It wasn't until some time later that we got the security camera video uh, from the compound that we were able to analyze. But we were in direct uh, communication insofar as it was possible because remember, uh, they were under heavy attack. Uh, we had a lot going on for those uh, diplomatic security officers to deal with. And then, as you know, uh, the attack uh, later moved to the CIA annex. Did you talk to Secretary Panetta that night? I talked with um, uh, Director uh, Petraeus. I talked on a video, secure video conference with uh, a full array of officials. Uh, I knew because I had talked with the National Security Advisor, Tom Donnelly, that both Secretary Panetta and uh, General Dempsey were doing everything they could. We you had didn't open speak lines. To him that night. I, I didn't. I can't. You know, I can't recall. I know that the Defense Department was in the room in the video conference that I held. Madam Secretary, in your testimony before the Senate on Benghazi mm -hmm. in January 2013, you stated this quote: "I certainly did not know of any reports that contradicted the intelligence community talking points at the time that Ambassador Rice went on the TV shows, mm -hmm. the Sunday shows." Mm -hmm. Do you stand by that statement? I do, Brett, and I wrote about this at length in my uh, book, a whole chapter on uh, the attack on Benghazi. This was the fog of war. You know, my own assessment careened from, you know, the video had something to do with it, the video had nothing to do with it. It may have affected some people, it didn't affect other people. And I think the, 
the conclusion to draw, because we were not just monitoring uh, what was happening in Benghazi once it began to unfold, but remember we had a very dangerous uh, assault on our embassy in Cairo that same day, which was clearly linked to that video. So I was trying to make sense of it. And, you know, I think that uh, the investigations that have been carried out basically conclude we can't say that everybody was influenced and we can't say everybody wasn't. But what the intelligence community said was spontaneous protests, and that is what, uh, at the time, they thought. Did, in the Benghazi chapter, you acknowledge that on the night of the attacks, you received a State Department Operations Center bulletin, in which, in the book, you say it's a report mm -hmm. that on responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did that report come to you? It came to me as those uh, uh, reports due to the Secretary of State. It was orally delivered. It was, you know, uh, a monitoring of a Facebook account that uh, said that. And then, as you know, and as I write in my chapter, that was reversed. So, Although we were, Ansar al-Sharia didn't fully pull it back, they said they didn't participate in this popular uprising mm -hmm. as a separate entity. So, Well, well there, there's no doubt terrorists were involved. There is no doubt. And uh, I, from the very beginning, and in my statements as... Uh, you know, and as I write in the in the chapter, uh, said that you know these were attackers. Now, who was leading them? We think we now have one of the ringleaders in custody, but others were either motivated because of their extremism and their ideology, and others came along for the ride, and maybe others also were motivated by the video. The timeline suggests President Obama. You had a conversation mm -hmm. on the phone, roughly mm -hmm. around 10 p.m. Yes. Do you talk to him before you put out a statement or after? Well, I don't. I didn't always talk to him before or after when I put out statements. We were in close well, I mean, communication. That oh, that night, um, that statement uh, went out. You know, I don't know the exact timing. It, my recollection is it went out before. Before the statement. Yeah. Do you know where yeah. the president was through the the attack? The president was in the White House. The president was in the Oval Office when I got word of the attack, and I called the White House asking for uh, National Security Advisor Donlin, who is our point of contact for the entire government, which would mean CIA, DOD, and others. And I was told, well, he's in with the president and with Secretary Panetta and General Dempsey. And I said, well, I need to talk to all of them. And I know from my conversations with uh, Panetta, Dempsey, and Donilon, and the president, that at that moment, the president said to our defense officials, do everything you can uh, to help uh, our people. Either before or after that, at 10.07, you put out this press release saying, quote, I condemn in the strongest terms the attack on our mission in Benghazi today. Some have sought to justify this vicious behavior as a response to inflammatory material posted on the internet. The United States deplores any intentional effort to denigrate the religious beliefs of others. Our commitment to religious tolerance goes back to the very beginning of our nation, but let me be clear, there is never any justification for violent acts of this kind. Did you talk about the video with President Obama? I, I don't know that uh, I talked uh, about it with him at that conversation. We had since, uh, on numerous occasions, because part of what we were trying to sort out is what caused this. I mean, I had a very clear sense of priorities protect our people, get them to safety, make sure that other attacks or threatened attacks at other embassies or other American posts are not going to happen. We need to get much more support from the governments of the countries where we are posting our people. And let's learn what happened so that we can try to prevent it in real time. Uh, so I know that there is a lot of um, questions, and, and I know you and, and your viewers have a lot of questions. And I would recommend that people read the unclassified version of the, uh, uh, the Accountability Review Board, which you can get off the State Department website, read what congressional committees have already put out wanna, because you will get the best information we currently have. I want to be fair and balanced to Greta here. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Secretary Greta. That is very fair. I like that. Right. Let me switch Thank to you. another topic. Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, would you have made that swap for Sergeant Bergdahl? Five Taliban for, the, mm -hmm. for Sergeant Bergdahl. Well, as I write in the book, and uh, uh, at the time, I was trying to put together a bigger deal, a deal that would uh, create a negotiation between the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban to try to move the Taliban to renounce violence, renounce al-Qaeda, and agree to support the Constitution and of, the laws. Isn't that part of their ideology, though, violence? I mean, I mean, look at the violence yeah. towards women. And, you know, we are, aren't we abandoning the women to the Taliban? Well, those are two different issues, and they're both really important, Greta. On, on what I did on my watch was to see whether we could do such a deal. And I write about it uh, in my book. And part of that deal was, you know, making some uh, concessions on getting 
Bergdahl back because that was very important to the Defense Department, to the State Department, and the rest of the government. And of course, the Taliban, in return, wanted to get some of their people back. So sequencing it, getting a bigger deal was part of the function. Today, however, I think what you heard from Secretary Hagel, as well as the White House, uh, Secretary Kerry and others, is that it appeared to be imperative to try to get Bergdahl out. I have not seen the video that people talk about. I cannot offer an independent judgment, but I rely on the judgment of medical professionals from defense and others. So I think the, the important points to make here, we never leave anybody behind. I think that's to our credit. Secondly, there is an agreement. I don't know the details, but I know what I was trying to negotiate with Gutter to keep these people uh, under uh, very strict uh, uh, vigilance and to prevent them from traveling. And number three, to debrief Bergdahl to get as much information from him when he's ready to talk. Right. You've been quoted as saying these five guys are not a threat to the USA. I think when people heard that, they were, they were quite surprised. Well, I mean, how are, as long as they're the in gutter, as long as they're in gutter, they're well, not a threat to the United well, States. Well, Bin Laden was never in the United States. No, no, but but in, in Qatar, with an agreement that has been uh, entered into, they are supposed to be constrained from what they can do, and certainly they are not supposed to be permitted to travel. That is, as my understanding uh, tells me, what the deal is. And in that situation, they are not a threat. Now, I agree with you that when the uh, new president, whoever that turns out to be, is sworn in in Afghanistan, there is no doubt, given the current atmosphere, that the Taliban is going to try to attack and take back territory. I worry particularly about the gains that have been made, the sacrifice that Americans made to enable those gains, particularly for women and girls. So this is a situation that is dangerous, that we have to keep watching. Those five men, they are right now not a danger if they are kept where they're supposed to be kept, but we still have to worry about the Taliban and everything that they could be doing. Right. Talk about lost gains. You were in favor of arming the moderate rebels in Syria. Now we've got this situation in Iraq where they weren't armed, and, and now we've got they were, where Iraq seems to be blowing up. Um, we, are we losing all the gains in Iraq as well? Too soon to tell. I think that uh, if uh, we can uh, persuade uh, or basically uh, bargain with Maliki so he does what we've been trying to get him to do for the last several years, an inclusive government where Sunnis feel they have a stake uh, as well as Shiites. Put us in bed with Iran? Well, I, I'm not in favor of any formal negotiations with or agreements with Iran at this time uh, regarding Iraq. In fact, if I were an Iraqi of whatever persuasion, I would be thinking hard about do I want Maliki to continue to be the prime minister? He has failed as a leader. He has purged the military of some of their strongest leaders. He has re rearranged the government and gone after Sunnis who were willing to work with him. That is a recipe for continuing instability. And if there's going to be a real stand against these extremists who are worse than uh, even is being reported uh, publicly in terms of what they're doing and how they behave, then there has to be a different government. And I don't think Maliki is the person to lead Iraq. 20 seconds. Was uh, then Senator Biden correct in saying a number of years ago it should have been divided into the three states, into the Kurds, Sunnis, and Shiites? Well, I think at the time uh, that was a, a creative suggestion that most people did not agree with because there was a hope that Hindsight? there could well, hindsight, it could not have been imposed on the Iraqis. It may end up evolving in that direction. At the time, though, no entity, not the United States or anybody, could have said, we're dividing up your country. You're going to get more oil than the other group. You're going to get you know, less opportunity to govern yourself. That was not going to be possible. All right, that's it for part one. Thank you, <laughs> Secretary. More questions and answers with Secretary Clinton after a quick break. Welcome to On the Record. I'm Greta Van Susteren. I'm joined tonight by former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and my colleague, Brett Baer. It's time to continue our interview now with the Secretary. I'll take the next seven minutes, followed by Greta. Two quick follow-ups on Benghazi, and then I want to move to something else. You talk about the fog of war. Mm -hmm. September 12th, Beth Jones, uh, the acting Assistant Secretary of State for Near East, sends an email to your Chief of Staff mm -hmm. and others saying she has been communicating with the Libyans, specifically the Libyan ambassador. Mm -hmm. And she writes, quote, when he said his government suspected that former Gaddafi regime elements carried out the attacks, I told him the group that conducted the attacks, Ansar al-Sharia, is affiliated with Islamic extremists. So I guess the question is, why 
is the State Department telling the Libyans, the Libyan ambassador was Ansar al-Sharia, mm -hmm. and yet telling the American people at the same time it was this video? Well, Brett, I think that you have to take both ideas at the same time. I don't know anybody who was saying it is only the video now, but I think at the time there was a lot of information flowing around that we were trying to assess that at least it played a part. We knew it had in Cairo, which is, you know, next door to Libya. But also we were trying to sort things out, like who did what when, and information kept changing. I mean, that is, you know, one of the challenges why I write about hard choices, because information's coming at you from all direction. It sometimes takes time to sort it out, find out what actually is uh, accurate, and frankly, what's not. I heard your interview with Diane Sawyer. What exactly are you taking responsibility for? Mm -hmm. I took responsibility for being at the head of the State Department uh, at that time. Now, that doesn't mean that um, I uh, made every decision because I obviously did not. But it does mean that I feel very deeply and, and very personally about the losses uh, that we incurred. Uh, and there were others who were lost in the line of duty uh, while I was uh, as secretary. And it also means that as a leader, I have a responsibility to try to figure out what happened and then to put into place changes that will prevent anything like that from happening again. And the United States government, just like any business, any family, any person, has to be a learning organism. We learned from the terrible attacks in Beirut uh, in 1983, where 250 Americans were killed in the Marine barracks and our embassy. We learned from the attacks on our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania uh, in 1998. And we are learning from this latest uh, terrible attack. We have to keep trying to figure out how we can be in dangerous places. I'm not one who says there is danger, so your responsibility is to get us out. No, my responsibility is to do the best job that I can leading a diverse group, relying on security professionals so that we can be in the hard places uh, to help make the hard choices. I guess for the people who look at the ARB, which mm -hmm. singled out four State Department mm -hmm. officials, uh, the ARB that you commissioned, mm -hmm. they didn't interview you. Uh, but one of those officials was set to retire, three were reassigned, and no one was fired. So uh, there are people who look at that and say, where is the accountability? Well, I understand that, and uh, we gave very specific direction. Uh, I said, you can go talk to anybody, you can see any document, anything you need to try to help me and help the American public and Congress understand what happened. So they had unfettered access to everyone, and they spoke to the people who they thought were involved in making the security decisions uh, that uh, you know they believed were uh, unfortunately inadequate for what we faced. At the same time, they made very clear that there was no authority within our current law. Remember, this group was set up under existing American law that you could not hold somebody accountable for a mistake. You know, there's a difference between getting it wrong and committing wrong. And what I asked for, and what I hope the Congress will do, the State Department is pushing this on Capitol Hill, is to give authority to be able to make certain decisions on you know, retention or uh, retiring uh, so that people who may be uh, responsible directly uh, can be held accountable. Did President Obama, during his first term, ever seriously disappoint you in any way? We had disagreements. Not policy differences. Uh, yeah. Did he seriously disappoint no, you? No, no, he did, he did not, Brett. Uh, you know, I have known uh, several presidents quite well, including my husband, and I worked um, closely with President George W. Bush and, and the White House then after 9-11, and I served uh, with President Obama. Uh, I disagree with all three of those presidents on certain things. I can tell you that right now. But I also believe each has tried to do what he thought was best for the country. And I would only be seriously disappointed in any president if I thought that in some way he was either ignoring uh, or undermining the national interest. And 
I never saw that in any of those three men, even though, as I say, I disagreed with all of them on something. Yeah. In an interview with CBS, you're asked about politics and the, a viable woman candidate if it's not you. Mm -hmm. And you replied, quote, politics is so unpredictable, whoever runs has to recognize that the American political system is probably the most difficult, even brutal, in the world. Yeah. Yeah. You've been to more than 100 <laughs> countries. I have. Most brutal? Well, I, I, you know, not in a beat you up sort of sense, but in an absolute marathon, running the gauntlet day after day. Most of our, our fellow democracies around the world, uh, many of which are parliamentary, uh, they choose a leader from among the elected officials who represent a constituency, but not the whole country. That's not where they're elected from. Many have time limits, uh, whether it's 60 days, 90, 120 days, so their campaigns don't go on for years. Many of them don't cost anywhere near as much. Uh, we require our candidates to raise all that money. Certainly a lot of them have rules that prevent other money from flowing in, influencing. I mean, you, you list all the differences. Now, I'm quick to add that... I guess just we, people perked up with brutal, I suppose. Yeah, I, well, it, you know, I think that that comes from experience because when I, I ended my uh, 08 campaign, I was exhausted, I was drained. It was quite uh, an experience. But I'm quick to add that, you know, part of it is we have a, a different idea about free expression, about the role of money in politics, as the Supreme Court has recently said, and we're a big, complex country. And so getting through that gauntlet to be one of the nominees to run for president requires a lot of stamina. Last thing quickly, the real clear politics average of major reliable polls, not just one, but the, the average of polls, uh, has the right track, wrong track breaking this way. 29% right track for the country. Mm. 64 percent wrong track. That's the average of polls. So do you agree with the 64 percent? What I agree with is that many Americans are still feeling uh, that they have not recovered from the Great Recession. They're still worried about their future, the future of their children. We could go down all the reasons why, from you know student debt uh, to you know stagnant or decreasing incomes to income inequality. All of these factors that Americans are living with, and they look and they say, "What happened to the American dream? I was raised with that. I'm a product of it. I am proud to be a product of it. I had a great upbringing. I had a family that supported me. Great public education. All these opportunities, as did my husband." And now people are saying, well, we think it's over. So of course they're going to say, regardless, I would argue who is president, I would say that most people are saying, wait a minute, it's not working for me anymore. What do we do to get back on track toward uh, people living up to their own God-given potential in this country that we love? Thank you, Madam Secretary Gretchen. Thank you, Brett. Madam Secretary, you're a lawyer. President Obama's a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. And NSA spying on Americans um, violates the Fourth Amendment. Couldn't be plainer. If you want to spy on Americans, you get a, a uh, you get a warrant. What do you think about that? Well, I think that we're finally taking stock of uh, the laws that we passed after 9/11. I voted for some and I voted against some. And people are saying, wait a minute, we did all of this in an emergency, in a hurry, because we were, you know, understandably worried and scared. And now we need to take a step back and figure out how we make sure that the balance between liberty and security uh, is absolutely right for America. Different question, different questions. When, when you go out and you seize American stuff, mm -hmm. you have to have a warrant. Mm -hmm. And an NSA was seizing American stuff no warrant and the and the and there are two options either amend the constitution or you get a warrant that wasn't done so what should the american people think well i think that the laws that were passed again post 911 gave very broad authority and that authority was passed by the congress it was overseen by the FISA courts, and it was endorsed by executives in two administrations, both Bush and uh, Obama. And I think what has happened is people have said, okay, the emergency is over, and we want to get back to regular order. We want to make sure that we're not being uh, spied on, that our privacy is not being violated. So. We want you to keep us safe. We want you to protect I, us, I don't, but I don't, we don't want Americans to be in any way 
uh, fearful of their own government's I, I don't uh, think, actions. I don't think any American wants to be unsafe. And I think every American wants to give the authority of the government to seize things constitutionally. Mm -hmm. The problem is we have this funny little thing called the Fourth Amendment. And it's actually quite plain. And I know everyone on Capitol Hill is trying to scurry and say that we've got these laws, and I hear you too. But the fact is, is that the Fourth Amendment is plain. It says you need a warrant. Well, I think what you're going to you're going to find with the laws that are now being amended and uh, passed, one was just passed uh, in in the house that the Congress is trying to square Americans' constitutional right uh, under the Fourth Amendment uh, and the necessity for information that can be connected to terrorist activity here at home or abroad. It's a really difficult balancing act, but you're 100 percent right that we have to make some changes in order to secure that privacy, that constitutional right to privacy that Americans are due. All right. Sergeant Tamarisi, he's a Marine. He's sitting in prison in, in uh, Mexico mm -hmm. since March 31st. Um, and uh, Mexico has not fast-tracked the judicial process. He's there after making an accidental turn. What can the United States do, or what should the United States be doing to help this Marine get fast-tracked through the judicial system because it was an accidental turn into right. Mexico? They, we should be doing, and I assume we are, you know, I'm not there, so I can't uh, speak directly to it, but we should be doing, or I can tell you what I would be doing, burning up the telephone wires, sending, you know, envoys, not just our ambassador, but others coming in, talking to the highest levels, Mexican officials, making it clear that this is really important to us. You know, we work with our uh, counterparts, our friends in Mexico on a lot of issues. Uh, obviously, it's something that is in our interest to do it as it is in theirs. But when this kind of uh, action happens and somebody who, as you say, made an accidental turn, who is serving our country, ends up in a prison, that is just unacceptable. Would you expect that if you were still Secretary of State and you made a phone call that they would they would get on this immediately? Well, I'm not sure it would be only one phone call. We might have to make a couple of them and call everybody that we could. But, but we, we have should... enough of diplomatic muscle with Mexico that this is, doesn't have to drag on this long. Well, you know, again, I don't know the specifics, but I certainly expect that everything is being done that can be done, but maybe we need to raise the decibels a little bit more. All right. Angela Merkel, uh, Chancellor of Germany, is up very upset that we were bugging her phone. Should mm -hmm. she be? Yes, she should be. That was absolutely uncalled for. And I, I've said that before. Uh, there is work that we need to do with the Germans and inside Germany. You know, I, I well remember that some of the 9-11 hijackers uh, got some of the training and some of the plotting went on in Hamburg, Germany, and we weren't able to penetrate that, and neither were our uh, allies in the German intelligence service. That has nothing to do with Angela Merkel's cell phone, and that should be off limits. Um, the sexism in politics. I agree there's sexism in politics. You write about it in your book. And at one point you write that the Obama administration, Obama campaign rather, after, um, after John McCain selected uh, uh, Sarah Palin, that they called you and wanted you to issue something that was dismissive of her, mm -hmm. and you said no. That's right. I did. And, and I write about it in the book because I, I want to make clear, number one, that uh, you know, I don't think attacking women for being women uh, or for trying to get the votes of other women uh, makes a lot of sense. And I think it's neither right nor smart. And so I made clear that I wouldn't do that. And shortly after that, the campaign uh, also agreed with it. Because I do, I do believe that sexism is still a problem. It's not just in politics. It's in journalism and business and all kinds of uh, uh, human endeavors in our country. And we have to call it out wherever we find it. Even with our friends, uh, we have to say, you know what, that's a line you shouldn't cross. Is that done, though? I mean, one of the most striking things to me, I, you know, I, I, look, I think there were terrible sexist things said about you. I mean, I, I have no doubt about it. But perhaps I think the one that I sort of put in a compartment all its own is that uh, um, Governor Sarah Palin, uh, there was a media article that, and many people ran with it, in which it said that she was not the mother of her special needs child. And I thought the silence was deafening. I was, I was hoping that a woman would speak up. I was hoping that a Democratic woman would speak up. But the silence was absolutely deafening. Well, I could not agree with you more, Greta, that those kinds of personal attacks, which I've had more than my share of because I have been in the political arena, are, you know, despicable and they should be called out. Uh, there's so much that moves so quickly in a presidential campaign, as you know so well. Uh, I can't uh, speak to who did or who didn't say anything, but I am absolutely with you that any kind of personal ad hominem or 
ad womanum uh, attack uh, should be repudiated. It seems to me that that would at least help some of the politics for women if, the, if people would cross parties and actually speak up because it would make it unsafe then for people to be critical with a known party and actually would focus on the issues um, and it would sort of get, you know, I, I think that that would sort of, you know, make it safer for women to be candidates. I think that's a really good idea and I think we ought to try to enlist more women and men to do just that and it ought to be uh, across the aisle and it ought to be from all segments of society. We don't do any service to ourselves, to each other, to young women coming up if we let those kinds of comments stand, if we you know, ignore the double standard, which still makes it very difficult for a lot of young women to feel that they have a role in the public sphere because of the way they're judged. So I, I'm with you on that, and maybe we could, uh, you know, work together to try to get some kind of pact or agreement that people will speak up as we go forward in politics. I thought I read your book, and I thought that actually I was disturbed by this. Richard Holbrook, who served our nation with great distinction in many ways, he helps uh, handle the war in Bosnia, uh, negotiate the Dayton Accords. That uh, when he was working for you. Um, people over at the White House would sometimes roll their eyes at him. And I, to me, I thought the arrogance of those people at the White House not respecting his contribution, that bothered me. You know, I think it was related to age. Just like we were just talking about what's related to gender, I think uh, a lot of younger people, and I wouldn't you know, exclude any part of society, wouldn't be just uh, at the White House or any one place, may not appreciate some of the struggles that our country has gone through, even in fairly recent times. But it was times. a know it all. And the way I read it in your book is that these, these and I take it it wasn't the president, mm -hmm. um, because, but I mean someone below the president, um, you don't name them, um, but it, it, the arrogance that they thought they knew better. And well, I, think I think that, and, and actually I, I think that makes it hard to sort of govern if your staff thinks that they're such know-it-alls. Well, I think part of it was Richard's experiences in Bosnia and his experiences going back to Vietnam, um, which he often talked about and drew comparisons with, uh, were not understood to be as relevant as Richard and I thought they were because we both had lived through both of those experiences. First in Vietnam as young people, he was a diplomat, and then uh, with the war in Bosnia. I, I view it as, you know, as kind of a, uh, a missed opportunity perhaps for people who didn't have the personal experience to have learned more. But one thing about Richard Holbrook, he was indefatigable and he was used to people, you know, saying, okay, Richard, it never stopped him. He just kept going. I also talk in the book how he followed me into a ladies room in Pakistan once because he was trying to get me to agree to something and I was still thinking about it and he thought I needed to agree right then. He, he, he was not bothered by any of this. I was the observer who thought, what a shame that people aren't really listening to someone who's one of the great diplomats uh, of our time. All right, President Obama has called the IRS scandal a phony scandal. Is it a phony scandal? Well, I think that any time the IRS is involved, for many people, it's a real scandal. And I think, though, that uh, there are some challenges uh, that right, uh, rightly need to be made to uh, what, are, what is being said, and I assume that the inquiry will continue. So I don't have the details, but I think what President Obama means there is there really wasn't a lot of uh, you know, evidence that this was deliberate, but that's it's why the hard. investigation needs it's, to continue. But it's really hard not to say it's deliberate when you have now we find out that there are two years of pertinent emails missing. So it's really it would be almost irrational not to be extremely suspicious. Well, and so it does. Now I, I wouldn't say phony. I no, would say well, this is real to uh, many Americans. Well, I think maybe the the right thing to say is. Uh, Let's investigate it, but let's do it in a as nonpartisan, uh, as fair-minded, fair and balanced as we can. I've heard that uh, because we we want to know what the facts are. But if you call it phony, you're trying to th you're trying to throw the dog off the scent. Well, but I, I think I think the I think not just the president, but anybody who says that is basically saying, you know, the circus around these investigations, and and you know that you're a longtime observer, are really kind of confusing what is happening, and it's important to get back to very professional. Uh, inquiries that can't be accused of politicizing because somebody may be worried about the answer they get or they don't get and let's try to find out uh, you know what the facts are. Secretary Clinton thank you I read the book uh, of course I traveled on many of these trips so it's was, it was fun <laughs> read thank you very much uh, and that concludes our special joint interview. Madam thank Secretary you. thank you very much. Thank you so much Brett my pleasure. Thank interesting you. Interesting back and forth. Thank you Brett.